Well, hello and welcome to Achieve CE, one place for continuing education for your license renewal and educational needs. On today's topic, I focus on diving into the future of clinical pharmacist role. My name is Bhavna Mutha. I'm RPH, BCMAS, BCMTMS, PDM, PDTM certified in the state of Georgia. And I currently also serve as chair of examination advisory board in BMTM. As a faculty, I have a wide variety of experience in the field for almost 20 years. Being a pharmacist with top honors, serving in retail, valedictorian graduate in the year of 1999. Being also invited as an international guest speaker at the 4th IACP Congress Convention, Chair of Examination Advisory Board, NBMTM Advisory Board, Nonprofit Pharmacist Moms Group, serving about 35,000 pharmacists in U.S. Also honored to be selected to serve on the PQA Leadership TEP panel for measure development and retirement process focused on diabetes and hypertension. I have also been honored to serve on the PQA Educational Advisory Council and honored to serve on APHA APPM SIG Committee. This activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support and I, Bhavna Muta, has no actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose. In the learning objectives today, at the conclusion of this activity, pharmacists will be able to describe the philosophy, goals, and outcome, outcomes of MTM services, discuss how the pharmacist can apply clinical skills and augment clinical outcomes for disease states, define motivational interviewing and its importance in effective patient communication, and they will also be able to have a glance on learning different enhanced MTM models ACO, ACL, which is Accountable Care Organization, and some highlights on PCMH, which is Patient-Centered Medical Home. Also, we will touch base on defining collaborative practice management on how it can provide autonomy in patient care. So when it comes to medication therapy management in pharmacy practice, I see a deep insight and vision for future of healthcare. The journey of medication therapy management in my life started in the year 2006-2007 when this program was incorporated um, in the United States by CMS. Over a period of time after the training for medication therapy management with my company, I was honored to be able to serve the patients and visit their home. This was my first patient one morning that I was visiting she was in her 90s, and I was so excited to provide my service for the first time. As I walked into her home, in those days we used to do some house calls. As I walked into her home, I found some blur spatter, you know, droplets on the carpet, which took my attention. I could not wait to find what medication she was taking. And to my surprise, when I got the whole basket of the medications that this woman was on or this patient in her 90s was on, I definitely found some combinations that told me the answer to the, the blood smattered on the carpet. This showed me the importance of medication therapy management and the role a pharmacist can play and impact into the patient's lives. We may not think drug interactions are as crucial to be considered when, when you decide the medication regimen for a geriatric population but then the adverse effects exist and many times patients do not even know about it. These adverse effects have caused so many hospitalizations. From that day on, medication therapy management became my part and partial. Even when I was serving in retail pharmacy, I pretty much would take the possible time to talk about the interactions and dosings to the patient as far as possible, serving in a very busy retail chain. So to start off, we all know the degree of Form D. Once you're finished with that, either a pharmacist can choose to go into the life sciences program or chose to become a clinical pharmacist. Life sciences is a whole world in itself, which takes you to become a scientist or work in an industry. Of course, the other aspect of which is clinical pharmacist. To me, I believe if you have a vision, you have a mission, and it's combined with action, we are capable of making global impacts in terms of healthcare. 
In terms of healthcare, a collaborative team is a very, very big part. Collaborative team, we know that consists of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. Many a times, the person who is not the part of the team is the patient. And the patient's willingness to take accountability and ownership of their health would be another factor to consider while serving and providing medication therapy management. To me, I just simply say, health is wealth and healthy nation contributes to a wealthy nation. So definitely we as clinical pharmacists are in position to provide global presence. Now, when we talk about medication therapy management, there are some acronyms that you want to get into your mind. Many of you are already providing those services and you are familiar with this uh, particular acronyms. So, of course, the three main elements are CMR, Comprehensive Medication Review, PML, Personal Medication List, MAP, which is Medication Action Plan. And recently, when we talk about intraoperability between different softwares, between different verticals of people presenting in healthcare, this mnemonic plays a big role, SBAR, which is Situation, Background, Assessment, and Review. This could be your possible communication way with your physicians. Of course, as pharmacists, we are trained to write soap notes, and so subjective, objective assessment plan is what constitutes in a soap note. And the fifth step after delivering a successful medication therapy management, CMR or comprehensive medication review is, of course, intervention, documentation, and follow-up. The problems that are encountered in talking to the patient while doing this comprehensive medication review are called as medication therapy problems or in some cases, drug therapy problems. And of course, this is all possible in today's generation because we have moved from a format of paper prescriptions to electronic health records, which allows us to have accessibility to a lot of data, be able to do comprehensive medication review. Now, who provides the comprehensive medication reviews? Are they provided by the pharmacist? And yes, of course, as you see in the graph, pharmacists can become 100% role players to provide comprehensive medication reviews. This can be done in collaboration with MD and nurse providers to form a complete care plan team. Now, people in medical field we know are you know, MDs, nurses, physician assistants, technicians, interns, but there is a limit on how much role they can play in providing this kind of services. Many a times in today's generation, we see a lot of uh, physicians or PAs or nurses are uh, drowning into paperwork and, um, and are crunching for time to be spent to the, with the patients. So pharmacists become the face of the patient in retail setting. Now that particular relationship when providing clinical services can become phenomenal and pharmacists can play a very, very crucial role in providing this kind of clinical services to our patient populations. When we talk about providing comprehensive medication reviews in 2006 to 2007, where I speak that I made some house calls and had to visit the patient's home, Things are changing in terms of COVID era. We all have gotten accustomed to something called telehealth. There is a use of artificial intelligence technologies, robots and boats, and auto dialers. According to US survey, pharmacists are 13th best paid professionals and an average salary, as we know, could range in between 120K with an unemployment rate of 1.6%. In the last five years, with the advent of AI, big data and robots are becoming more trustworthy to doctors. And robots are, of course, replacing human work in some cases. Benefit of artificial intelligence is, is it is very capable of accurately analyzing large and large amounts of data. Stephen Hawkins said, this may mean end of human race. But we are going to focus on the positives. AI should be partnered with humans for execution of the best healthcare delivery. And so artificial intelligence combined with the data and good communication platform can cause and bring positive disruption in healthcare and patient clinical outcomes. 
So let's come to look at why MTM? What is medication therapy management? What is the overall benefit? The biggest benefit that providing MTM services can bring is reduction of overall healthcare cost and burden. Patients use the medications in a more beneficial and a more cost effective manner. So this is a big benefit that the patients get from this kind of services. Let's talk about what are the benefits for the physicians. In the busy settings of phys practices that physicians are in, and the amount of expectations and the number of guidelines and protocols that physicians have to follow, this can be become a com can become a complete support uh, or a backbone to the physician having a pharmacist help do a lot of suggestions, verifications, drug interactions, and of course verification of information that may be missing, or this may help them spot errors in patient records that could be have that could have been overlooked. So drug therapy education for patients after the physician has done their basic job, pharmacists can play a big role in augmenting the same knowledge and information with detailed approach in talking to the patients. So these are a couple of benefits that you can see with MTM that a patient can have, that a physician can have, and the overall impact in the healthcare settings. On the next slide, I'm going to come on to the basic philosophy, the outcomes and goals of MTM goals. So when we talk about philosophy, this is more patient-centered rather than product-centered. If you go to a pharmacy and say you're picking a prescription for your Levaquin for a particularly ongoing infection, the pharmacist may counsel you at the counter, but at that time, in that setting, that becomes the product-centered delivery of clinical outcome or clinical necessity at that point. But in MTM, an entire profile for the patient is considered. And so when um, it's beyond the single medication, it gives you an opportunity to see what interacts with what. And of course, the biggest asset with MTM is entire care team being involved. As soon as the pharmacist finds something that is contraindication, indicated that has a drug interaction or that the dosing is not safe, they are in the position to go right and left both. Going right is contacting the doctor and getting the situation rectified or corrected. Going left is making the patient aware about what they found in their profile or what could be changed. And this could be big time playing a big role in terms of adherence when the patient will not take the medication just because of the cost issues. So this gives the benefit for the pharmacist to give a complete circle in terms of expanding their knowledge both ways. What are the outcomes of MTM goals? It leads to the patient's increased adherence. It leads to increased patient's understanding and self-management skills. Many times in my service, I have noticed people taking blood pressure medications and once they start feeling better, they think that it is not a necessity for them to continue on those medications. The pharmacist can interject at this point and let them know how high blood pressure can be affecting and damaging the organs. So this is something that can help you lead to adherence for the patient, protect the patients, um, kidneys and heart from having to take the medication on a regular basis. So what are the main goals of MTM? It helps you reduce preventable adverse events and associated cost, reduction of mortality and morbidity that comes from medications, and the big one is reduced healthcare cost due to duplicate or unnecessary prescriptions. And in today's generation, polypharmacy and prescribing cascade has become a humongous problem that we see in certain cases where you see the medications like PPIs are prescribed for a certain period of time and the patient seems to continue it for years and years not knowing um, the refills are coming from the doctor, somebody did not find the time to look if that was really necessary for the patient. So of course, this plays a big role in helping you with prescribing cascade and polypharmacy. So this was some of the basic contents of what we are going to be looking into when it comes to medication therapy management. So let's go ahead and back, go ahead into reflecting 
The question number one I have, which of the following options does not reflect the main philosophy of MTM program? A. Increased adherence to medications. B. Reduce mortality and morbidity. C. Reduce adverse drug events. D. Opportunity for remote services and flexibility in patient care. reflect on this question, you should directly know the answer and the one that's not crucial at this point is the choice D. The rationale behind is although MTM provides a platform for telehealth and remote services for large population outreach, it is not the main goal for providing flexible work module for healthcare professionals. This is an asset and in terms of uh, COVID era, it has become the biggest, biggest asset that we had that we were able to deliver uh, medication therapy management service and clinical services to the patients via telehealth model. But of course, this is one of not one of the main philosophy or goal of MTM. This was a little bit of tricky question right there. So moving on the gears from medication therapy management to chronic care disease management, in medication therapy management, you get a chance to assess the patient, you get a chance to evaluate medication therapy, develop and implement plan of care, documentation, follow-up, and monitoring. In this picture, I see this picture is so amazing because I see all those four people who are focused on patient care. The next element that comes after medication therapy management is chronic care disease management. Chronic care disease management has certain elements that go with it. And the patients who have total number of drugs taken between two to eight will fall into that range. They of course have multiple chronic disease states and these disease states are expected to last at least 12 months or until death. Sometimes I put an example like obesity. Obesity could be very challenging for a patient to get over and have more and more problems coming in terms of comorbid conditions from obesity. And this is something that could last until patient's death. And of course, a chronic state of disease that can cause decompensation and functional decline, which would be uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, and many other disease states like that. So these are a couple of elements that you look into when you provide chronic care disease management services. And this is something that as a pharmacist can bring more avenues and take you on to the next steps of gaining provider status and making bigger impacts and strides in healthcare. Let's come to the next slide here. What I talk about is health literacy and socioeconomic status. And when providing those kind of services, it is so important to understand the patient's health literacy levels. It is important to get down to the level of patient when doing communication and giving them education about their health. There's a little saying that goes with it. The way we communicate with others and with ourselves ultimately determines the quality of our lives. May the quality of your communication foster a quality work environment and quality outcomes for the patients. So when providing those kind of services, motivational interviewing is one of the techniques and the philosophy to help individuals with behavioral change. Screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, which is SBIRT, is a successful technique for addressing alcohol and other substances used with patients. SBIRT stands for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. In this case, we apply the element of being non-judgmental. Of course, when you are deciding uh, or providing a lot of written material to the patient, you want to avoid any medical jargons, acronyms, or abbreviations, and possibly try to Use larger fonts, a preferred language by the patient, simple terms. In terms of helping them remind to take their medications, 
Tools like pillbox or setting alarm, alarms could be a very big asset. And of course, at times when you're personally providing services to the patient who has difficulty understanding or you're using a teach-back method, symbols and pictures can be another asset or tool. According to a 2003 nationwide study, the National Assessment of Adult Literacy, only 12% of the over 19,000 adults surveyed were found to be proficient in health literacy and only 3% of those 65 years and older demonstrated any proficiency. So this is a couple of factors that you want to keep in mind when delivering your services. A couple of things that you want to really do well is to listen well. The listener must be engaged, noticing nuances of what is said, observing and attending to the non-verbal cues, and providing useful responses to the speaker. Choosing to listen to the patients in order to understand them and then communicate, communicating that understanding back to them is called patient-centered. Of course, empathic responses explicitly acknowledges the emotional aspect of what has been said and the reason for such emotion. Many times, nonverbal communication contributes to how individuals understand each other, especially when feelings are expressed. And there are different modes of communication example in person, telephone, telehealth have unique communication requirements. And even if you're providing a medication therapy management service to a patient on the telephone, your smile can go across to th through the verbiage or through the style of your communication to the patient. So those are a couple of elements you want to put in picture when interviewing a patient for providing comprehensive medication review. As a process, of course, the te techniques of communication and motivational interviewing are the most important thing. In this whole process, the first part is to collect the patient data, which is the medications the patient's taking on, the possible lab values. Then the next stage comes is patient interview. As you do the patient interview, a couple of things that are very important is setting the stage, um, as a simple fact, like if you're sitting in a cluttered room and your patient's visiting you and it's not enough room, this is going to build up some hesitancy for the patient to open up. A simple, simple thing can make such a large impact. And as I said, data from Rx and labs, the accuracy of data will help you guide uh, more clinical outcomes as you discuss to the patient. Communication style with open-ended questions and open stance this is the most crucial and the most important aspect of providing medication therapy management services. Patient priority with DTP, drug therapy problems. You might have a complicated patient where you see that everything needs to be fixed in this patient's life. Could you do that in one encounter? Would it be appropriate to fix all of those things in one encounter? Definitely not. And so when you prioritize your drug therapy problems, you want to start off with what is the most important aspect for the patient. For example, the patient has high blood pressure, the patient's smoking, um, the blood sugar levels are also off, and the patient's dealing with some major depression issues. But in this case, when you talk to the patient, the patient reflected his grit and will to, to quit smoking. So as you're talking to this particular patient, and as much as you do not want to bombard the patient with a lot of information, the first and foremost thing that the patient was interested in uh, quitting smoking, you would start up on that particular aspect because in this one, patient is engaged, patient is willing, and patient is making changes. So whatever information you have provided will be absorbed. The last part of the CMR process is, of course, MD communication. And this process, if you find any of the uh, factors that are overlooked by MD or that comes into picture because there are a couple of different doctors in picture for a patient's profile. Your communication with MD is very, very crucial that you do not appear condescending. You do not appear as if somebody has made a lot of mistakes and now it is your honor or privilege to correct those. You want to be a partner and a team with your doctor and bring up to them how you were able to find something that just might be an oversight or overlook. So gaining that trust, 
with your physician is of crucial, uh, high crucial importance because once you have earned the respect from your doctor, the doctors will be looking forward to a lot more suggestions that are coming from evidence-based medication research, you know, literature lookup, uh, and the doctor, you will become strong shoulders to support the doctors. So those are a couple of things and um, that you want to always keep in mind when delivering an effective, comprehensive medication review service. When we talk about motivational interviewing, I'm just going to go a little bit more detail on an example of what can be classified as an open-ended question. And this is, how are you doing? A simple fact, within the dominant United States culture is one of the very classic open-ended questions. How did you decide to change the time you take your medicine? Is a way to ask why and question without using the word why that would not be very appropriate. It would be like you're putting some pressure on the patient trying to tell me why did you take that particular action? Next one is, are you able to infuse it by yourself or is the visiting nurse still helping you? That of course is an open-ended question. Now, if you try and ask a patient, are you doing all right? It's considered as a loaded question. Which side effects bothers you most? This is considered as a double-barreled question. So looking at those factors is a couple of uh, examples of asking probing questions. And to ask probing questions is a means of active listening as it effectively conveys to the patient that you have hurt him, him or her. Empathic responses acknowledge the patient's emotional response as well as the reason for, you, for it. And active listening includes summarizing or paraphrasing what a patient has just told you. So this is like a very short and compact, you know, some of the key pointers to apply when you're doing motivational interviewing with your patients. So the next element after doing the CMR is preparing a medication action plan. When you find the problems that you encountered in talking to the patient, you will be able to document those on a document called medication action plan. So when you prepare the medication action plan, there are a couple of goals that you want to keep on mind. Patient ownership and engagement. Like I said earlier, this patient is engaged and want, is wanting to take ownership on quitting smoking. You want to honor the fact because you're going to get the maximum output because of the patient's willingness and ownership and engagement. Of course, the next part comes actionable steps. If somebody weighs, you know, 300 pounds and they're trying to lose the weight, and if you give them a target of a correct body mass index, that is going to be a difficult situation. So you want to go step by step, you know, how many pounds per month or how many pounds per week, what are the processes, what are the different diets, you know, how much... Uh, resilience and grit you need to get there, how exercise can impact. So all of these small, small goals can take you to the larger goal and every step should be actionable and achievable. This also constitutes an example for the SMART goals. What kind of goals do you set? And in terms of smoking, if you said, well, call it a cold turkey and move on, it's not going to work because many times patient default back when they try to do something like that. So you want to set smart goals when talking to the patient. Medication safety, of course. Most of your populations are going to be somebody who's suffering from chronic disease states or 65 and a up. And so you're looking, going to look at two different factors. Beer's criteria that you apply for geriatric population and making sure that the drug dosing and regimen is within the safe guidelines. The biggest factor you see with our geriatric population is the risk of fractures and falls from the combination of different medications. And in my service, I've seen many of the patients are not even aware. When we try to call these patients, you find them, they're sleeping, they're sleeping in the morning, in the afternoon, they're drowsy, they have difficulty waking up, walking around. And these patients reflect a very, very high level of risk for falling in fractures, more hospitalizations, and so definitely you want to focus and zoom in on those kind of problems. 
The other one is reduction of cost in drug waste uh, is another element when medications are not covered by the insurance and the patient is having to jump from one medication to another one uh, or because of side effects. You know, if some patient had a large problem with muscle breakdown, uh, muscle pain all throughout, and they've been given a very high potency statin, you definitely know that very possibly the patient might react and quit taking that particular statin and say they have a prescription for 90 days, um, that's going to be a complete waste where we are going to try and get them to take some different medication. So that is a, a shorter part where you can impact in terms of uh, cost where we can avoid the drug wastage and reduce the cost and of course reduce the, the billions of healthcare you know, dollars burden that we all experience. So now talk about the positive outcomes and meta-analysis. Where does this MTM come from? There was a lot of research studies done a couple of years ago, and this is just a simple slide, where I want to focus on how much change um, that can reflect just by providing those kind of services. So say, for example, you know, 2,200 or 20 to 46 number of patients were studied for diabetes were found to have reduction in HbA1c levels by the guidance from the pharmacist uh, has played a very big role in hypertension, congestive heart failure, leading to reduced hospitalizations. Um, we are able to impact reduction of systolic blood pressure by certain levels. And the biggest one is patient safety, where you know you have impacted positively to less adverse drug reactions and improved adherence and Hades measures. So these are a couple of factors that were always um, came into picture uh, with positive outcomes and meta-analysis uh, studies. So on the next slide, we focus on role of pharmacists in patient education. If you see this slide, this is talking about the warning signs of stroke. And there's a very good example that I have encountered personally in my life that I like to share with. There were two different aspects of you know, different patient pools that I had to deal with in my life career. One of the patient was very well aware about the different signs of stroke to recognize it at an early stage and even be able to drive himself to the hospital and be okay because of he, his ability to get treatment and hospitalization on the time. On the other hand, there was a patient who had no idea of what to expect or know about the stroke and who pulled through the night and before morning was unable to make it to the doctors on time and was declared, uh, you know, the patient passed away basically. It's just a simple part of education, understanding and implementation can play a very, very big role. So this mnemonic here shows, you know, the signs like it's called as fast face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties, unexplained dizziness, severe headaches, and blurred vision. Say it's a pharmacist who played a crucial role in educating a patient who has a family history of stroke. This could become very helpful for the patient to be empowered with the knowledge to take the right decision and right step when needed, which could turn into a life-saving intervention for this particular patient. So these were a couple of key elements to discuss in the process of CMR. This, this constitutes uh, as an interview, it needs to be structured, which means the pharmacist should keep control of the conversation while acknowledging and working within the needs of the patients. This is when you're talking uh, into the process of CMR. The introduction of the CMR is recommended to contain a brief explanation of the role for, of the patient during the interview, setting the expectations, what you're going to expect from the patient in terms of knowledge, uh, helps them prepare to get ready for such process, and which is very crucial to the final outcome of the CMR delivery. It is also recommended that pharmacists follow up an important patient-initiated tangential inquiry by first acknowledging the importance of the patient's inquiry. And of course, effective closure of the CMR should include the next steps for the patient and for the pharmacist. So in this case, say for example, your patient um, is at high risk for stroke, what are the 
initiated uh, initiated actions that you will take for the patient in terms of education, contacting the doctor, looking for further medications to be applied in the regimen. And sometimes while providing uh, MTM services, it is very common to use something called service script. And uh, effective closure of the CMR should, of course, include the next steps. And the service script, it is a element or a tool for quality assurance that helps ensure that the same service quality is provided to each patient every single time. So this helps us switch gears from the world of MTM um, to the next aspect. And everything I said is patient-centered. So the elements that are used in something called patient-centered medical home, the key functions and attributes, what are the key functions for the medical home? Three key functions that you see on this particular slide constitutes of comprehensive care, patient-centered care, and coordinated care. Now in medical home mo model, it holds promises as a way to improve healthcare in America by transforming how primary care is organized and delivered. And as defined by AHRQ, the medical home encompasses five different functions and attributes. The three which we reflected just now was comprehensive care, patient-centered care, coordinated care. In comprehensive care, of course, you are looking at patients' physical and mental health care needs through a team-based approach. In patient-centered care, the primary care that is oriented towards the whole person. When you're looking at the patient, you are considering the patient's family background, the respect for their culture, their unique needs, and their preferences and values. When we talk about coordinated care, we are looking into all the elements of the healthcare system, such as the specialty care, hospitals, home health care, and of course the different community services with an efficiency on efficient care transitions. The other two elements that are crucial to uh, patient-centered medical home are accessible services and quality and safety. In considering the accessible services, the PCMA at six to make primary care accessible through minimizing the wait times by enhancing office hours and after hours access to providers and through alternative methods such as convenience of using a telephone or an email. When you talk about quality and safety, in this model, it is committed to providing safe and very high quality care through clinical decision support tools, using evidence-based care, shared decision making, performance measurement, and population health management. Sharing the quality data and improvement activities also contribute to the systems level commitment quality. So those are the five elements we see which are very, very crucial to PCMAH, which is patient-centered medical home. Many times, AHRQ's primary care practice facilita facilitation learning community provides information and learning opportunities to individuals with an interest in practice facilitation as one way to improve the primary care practice. What activities do practice facilitation programs support? So it has a couple of elements that it will support to help you facilitate and apply the PCMH programs into your practice, like using our practice level data to drive the change, or training simply the staff in the quality improvement methods and specific transformation processes, such as team-based care, or formation and facilitation of practice quality improvement teams, executive coaching and leadership training, best practices in quality improvement structures and methods, of course, more support and encouragement, reinforcement and recognition of those success procedures, uh, project and change management. Also, the next aspect we see in practice facilitation is identification and procurement of the resources, capacity building in the use of health IT to support improved clinical care, uh, cross-pollination of good ideas and best practices between different primary care practices, capacity building for improved linkages to the outside, outside resources, um, the need for technical assistance in implementing particular models of care, such as chronic care model, in which we are going to see a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. 
In addition to supporting the general quality improvement work in these specific activities, the practice facilitators also can support activities more directly related to patient-centered medical home transformation goals. The another way of executing patient-centered care is through accountable care organization. So what is an ACO? ACO are groups of doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers. They come together voluntarily to give a high quality coordinated care to the Medicare patients. The goal of coordinated care is of course to ensure that the patients get right care at the right time while avoiding unnecessary duplication of services and preventing of medical er errors. When, when an ACO succeeds both in delivering high quality care and spending healthcare dollars more wisely, the ACO will sh share in the savings it achieves from the Medicare program. So these are the three goals of accountable care organizations, better care, better health, and better cost. And this can be achieved with population health management, care coordination, and of course, patient engagement. So when you discuss elements of accountable care organization, though these are the crucial factors that you put into consideration. Of course, selecting evidence-based medicine, financial management, uh, the health plan plays a very big role. Enterprise IT, of course, becomes the backbone of uh, these elements and service integration and population management. So this is a real good quote that I found about social determinants of health, which is SDOH. We're really moving towards more holistic assessment and stratification of the population of patients. And then we are aligning very closely with our community health and well-being programs to make sure that we are not just within the four walls of the hospital system, but that we are reaching into the community to develop these close partnerships to address the various social determinants of health. And there are some few slides coming forward which will exemplify the uh, elements of SDOH. So there are a couple of different ACO models, a ACO uh, investment model, Medicare shared savings programs, and this um, data exists on the CMS website as well, which is for fee-for-service beneficiaries. For the ACO investment model, for Medicare shared savings programs, ACOs to test prepaid savings in rural and, rural and underserved areas. There are a couple of other different models exist like advanced payment ACO model for certain eligible providers already in or interest in the Medicare shared savings program. Uh, this another one is very crucial, comprehensive end-stage renal disease care initiatives for beneficiaries receiving dialysis service. The next generation ACO model uh, for ACO's experience in managing care for populations of patients. Uh, of course, this will help you address the health disparities and health equities. Um, pioneer ACO model, healthcare organizations and providers already experienced in coordinated care for patients across care settings, and then Vermont all-payer ACO model, effort to transform healthcare for Vermont's population. So all of these programs and the details are available on CMS website. Um, and these are again, you know, available um, to look at different aspects of implementing accountable care organization. This is the next slide where we again, focus on the most important ones of the basic um, ACO models that exist on the CMS website. So the next thing when you talk about is um, the shared savings programs. The rural shared savings program, ACO identified a number of elderly patients who visited the emergency department on a regular basis for non-emergent problems. So these patients described how their living environment left them feeling socially isolated and they went to the emergency department to address medical issues that were compounded by a sense of loneliness and anxiety. So to prevent avoidable emergency department use, the ACO partnered with local faith-based organizations to establish a senior buddy program and then asked its primary care practice to discuss the program with elderly 
एक एक वो बेनिफिशरीज हु हैड हाई इमरजेंसी डिपार्टमेंट यूज If the beneficiaries were interested in the faith-based partner organization, matched them with volunteers and initiated a series of regular buddy visits. Though only a handful of beneficiaries currently participate in the buddy program, their emergency department visits have dropped by fifty percent relative to what it was before the program began. Given this early success, the ECO plans to expand the program. So this is one of the example of uh, you know success coming out of an accountable care uh, organization, and in this slide you see you know you see the success, the volunteer part, the buddy program, compounded problems described, and the shared savings program in combination with the eco model. So this is such a great example that will always stay with you. What happens you know with geriatric problems coming from just a simple fact of social isolation? and how that could be solved with having volunteer based faith programs encounter and bring in some buddy support system so on the next slide it shows how eco improves health outcomes for beneficiaries with chronic conditions the objective for that is to reduce readmissions among beneficiaries with chronic respiratory and cardiac conditions The tactic utilized is to visit the beneficiaries at home to evaluate environmental safety and encourage self-management by providing education and support. And and exactly how this is brought into picture is reflected on the next slide here. Um, the entire process of the ECO partnership um, is reflected on this particular slide. This is a little busy slide with a lot of information, but this is a good example of an ECO model that will constitute to the success of a uh, patient's clinical outcome and self-care management. The shared savings program ECO developed a program to improve healthcare outcomes for beneficiaries who receive hospital care. for conditions related to chronic respiratory diagnosis or congestive heart failure so the echoes in patient care manager contacts an ambulance service partner who sends staff to the beneficiary's home within a day of discharge to conduct a home safety evaluation now the staff also make sure that beneficiaries have filled their prescriptions have nebulizers and other equipments needed to manage their condition and then understand their post discharge instructions in addition for beneficiaries with COPD the ECO's respiratory therapist also visit with beneficiaries in their home to inform them about effective self care management now the therapist also confirms that the beneficiaries are receiving ongoing care from a primary care physician or a pulmonologist having an emergency medicine pack in their home and know about a dedicated telephone number that the ECO operates for beneficiaries with the COPD Say so beneficiaries call this number. The eco staff assess the beneficiaries' needs and then connect them to a population health coach, or a primary care physician, or the ED if there is a true emergency. Although eco implemented the program recently, beneficiaries have already reported feeling safer and less anxious about it managing their conditions. So ECOs use a range of metrics to decide whether a given provider or practice is eligible for shared savings payment each year, and many ECOs focus on utilization and quality measures. Though some also consider other factors such as measures of provider engagement, example attendance at meetings, in network referral rates, and compliance with the ECO guidelines for assessing patient risk, example. updating patients higher care condition category assignment at each visit so when selecting metrics for distributed share savings ecos consider several factors which is availability of data for calculating the measure example a measure may require data pull from multiple ehr systems strength of the evidence for connecting measure performance to healthcare cost of patient outcomes um, ability of clinicians to take action to improve their performance on the measure conciseness of the measure set that is having a small number of measures alignment with measures used in other value based contracts we felt like those core components of our metrics were controllable by the doctors and the contracts we felt like those core components of our metrics were controllable by the doctors and the doctors could have an impact on the metrics directly by seeing the patient and having a care relationship with that member 
So of course, a co-administrator utilization measures may include the total cost of the care or the use of high cost services that may indicate poor care management, such as unnecessary emergency department visits um, that could be avoidable re readmissions. So quality measures may include many of the formal quality measures CMA uses to assess the ACO performance. Uh, and let's come to the next uh, slide here. These are the different quality measures that can be implemented in sharing, uh, shared saving distributions. Uh, of course, the annual Medicare wellness visits, preventative care immunizations where the focus goes on all the shingles vaccination, pneumonia vaccination, timely flu shots, uh, Tdaps, and of course now uh, is the addition of COVID shots into the picture here. Uh, doing the preventative screenings for um, cancer, like breast and colorectal cancer screenings. Uh, in terms of diabetes controls, looking into HbA1c measures and uh, the levels of nephropathy that the patient is in. Uh, in terms of hypertension and lipid therapy, assessing the numbers on their systolic and diastolic blood pressure levels. And in terms of management of lipid therapy, uh, assessing if the patient is smoking, diet and exercise, and levels of uh, triglycerides and LDL cholesterols. Um, so all of those factors constitute towards the contribution of quality measures and shared savings um, uh, distributions. The next aspect is something called collaborative practice agreement. In the collaborative practice agreement, a process, the pharmacist is capable of um, achieving a very good collaboration with the physician that they decide to work with. And as they work with, um, in the true in relation of the collaborative working relationship model as developed by McDonough and Dosset, it is advocated the pharmacist target the physicians. The past professional recognition is characterized by the development of collaborative practice agreement. The most important step when you look into developing a collaborative practice is an intermediary stage which is characterized by a time of trial in which the physician tests the pharmacist's commitment and ability. So there are a couple of uh, sections that comes into picture where as a pharmacist you should be able to portray the changes you can bring to the practice, um, the MIPS calculation for that particular practice, uh, for example, every state has their own regulations in developing the collaborative practice agreement protocol. Georgia provides drug therapy modification license, uh, drug algorithms and practice guidelines to be defined. So that is a relationship that is sometimes developed between the physician, the pharmacist, and in some states, a pharmacist can go into collaborative practice agreement even with a nurse practitioner. So what happens under the uh, umbrella of collaborative practice agreement? This gives you a lot of ownership in providing autonomy in patient care, where you are able to reach the patients who are eligible to be provided by those services, depending on their comorbid conditions. Uh, and of course, you definitely get reimbursed for your services as a collaborative practice um, partner with the physician. You're able to make an impact in the patient's life and you're able to support the physician in making guided decisions, uh, decisions about evidence-based medications. Um, of course, collaborative practice agreement shows promises in future where if the pharmacist is provided provider status, um, they would be able to impact the healthcare in positive manner by developing such practice agreement protocols with the physicians you know, in providing the, you know, lab monitoring, lab orderings, pharmacogenetic consultations, immunizations, patient educations, medication management check, um, you name it, there are so many different aspects that the pharmacist can play a crucial role. And of course, we are uh, still in unrecognized phase when it comes to a healthcare partnership team. And at some point, this is my vision that we become providers uh, having the knowledge of the drugs and the medications, we can make a bigger impact um, being a part of the physician's team. So this is some of the examples of collaborative practice agreement. 
in 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 few upcoming slides we will look into the billing aspects of collaborative practice agreement as well where the pharmacist can be reimbursed for the services they provide and impact the physician's practice and also increase the revenue for the physician's practice the next aspect um, that we look into is uh, something that is newer one enhanced mtm model the CMS launched a pilot program to test changes in the traditional MTM model over a period of time. Enhanced MTM implements program changes like increased payment incentives, and it provides the big thing here, which I underlined, flexibility, patient enrollment requirements. It gives more fle regulatory flexibility to the plans um, in deciding you know, what patients are eligible for MTM services. So how do this MTM enhanced program differ from a traditional MTM model? Uh, as I said, design flexibility is one of the very big part where party sponsors are free to alter the eligibility criteria for MTM services and uh, to vary the services provided. Compared to the CMS requirements for traditional MTM offerings, one yearly CMR and quarterly TMRs, plans are free to alter their service offerings considerably. And of course, the second element is payment incentives. Enhanced MTM provides administrative funding to the Part D sponsors in the form of prospective per enrollee payment. So if sponsors reduce Medicare spendings in the identified population, they are eligible to receive additional incentive payments. So there was some reflection on the applications of enhanced MTM model. And these are a couple of um, examples or elements of enhanced MTM model where drug therapy programs or uh, which targeted drug-related patient safety issues, non-adherence or likely, likelihood of future non-adherence to specific drugs for new or existing users, high drug utilization or opioid utilization. Um, the second application is chronic disease programs which targeted beneficiaries managing specific chronic diseases or multiple chronic diseases. The third one is high spend programs, which targeted beneficiaries with high medical or drug expenditures. And the, the fourth one here is transitions of care programs, which targeted beneficiaries with a recent inpatient discharge. And um, we'll see some of the, you know, billing aspects of the transitional care management program and chronic care disease management in uh, next slides here. So, of course, the CPT billing codes um, that calls for reimbursement to the pharmacist for their services. Um, these are the examples that are used in MTM services, which is uh, the first one is 99605-606-607. Uh, use of 99607 in conjunction with 99605 and 606. So the, the billing codes are utilized depending on the, uh, the initial time which is 15 minutes uh, of medication therapy management service provided by the pharmacist. It could be either face-to-face, -face, uh, and now we are also able to do telephonic or via telehealth. So initial 15 minutes for an established patient is 99606, and 607 reflects each additional 15 minutes that is uh, listed in separate addition to the code for the primary services. So these are the three basic uh, CPT codes used for medication therapy management services. Um, there are more uh, service billing codes that um, office or other outpatient services, which is called incident to billing. Uh, all the 99, 211, 212, 213, 214, 215. Uh, this could be only utilized where you are present in the physician's office providing service services in the presence of physician. Uh, the next ones are transitional care management services. Um, this billing codes are appropriate for a patient. Um, and of course, these have many more uh, different specifications to those, you know, when you contacted the patient after the discharge from the hospital within the seven days period, within the 14 day period. So there are different elements to be considered, but those are the basic codes that you use for transitional care management services. And the last one that is, um, you know, that could be executed 
under a collaborative practice agreement with the physician is services provided by chronic care management services. And the billing codes used for chronic care management services are uh, 99490487489, depending on the complexity of the patient, the time utilized in uh, doing the service. Uh, and there's a new code 99491, I think from the year of 2021. Um, so these are some of the basic CPT codes that can be used as a billing element in the reimbursement for the services provided by you to the physician and the patient. Um, so this can become a revenue income stream for the pharmacist. This can also bring in additional revenue to the doctor's offices. And the bigger picture of this whole thing is, um, is plugging the, the missing piece of the puzzle, which is pharmacist into the care team, uh, and providing the services where they're able to utilize evidence-based medication, uh, all the aspects of knowledge about the drug therapy, which becomes to me as a win-win combination for the entire healthcare team. So those were a couple of reimbursable CPT course that can help you build your practice if you decide to go into collaborative practice agreement with the physician. Now we talked a lot of different aspects of MTM, chronic care disease management, talking to the patient, motivational interviewing skill. Let's, let's look at another case study here. So there is a 75 year old female with type two diabetes and is being treated with metformin 500 twice a day. At a recent visit, her A1C was 7.5%. Other labs revealed a fasting glucose of 135 milligrams per dl and serum creatinine of 1.7 milligrams per dl. Her estimated glomerular, glomerular filtration rate is 29 ml per minute um, per 1.73 meters square. Which recommendation is most appropriate for her metformin therapy? So as a medication therapy management or a chronic care disease management pharmacist, the first thing you would lay your eyes on is her A1C numbers and of course uh, the drug called metformin and its relation to the kidney levels. So will you decide A, continue to current dose of continue the current dose of metformin, uh, B, decrease the dose of metformin, C, discontinue the metformin, D, increase the dose of metformin. Is to discontinue the metformin because as a pharmacist you're trained to look at the drug the kidney levels, the cause that metformin can cause, and so you will come to the conclusion of discontinuing the metformin. So what is the rational behind this? Uh, metformin should not be used in patients with an EGFR of less than 30 ml and should not be started in patients with EGFR between 30 and 45. If EGFR falls between below 45 and patients already taking metformin, benefit to risk of continuation should be considered. So these are the evidence-based guidelines that are available for the medication and that should help you get the rational on making the decision for the patient and making a suggestion to the doctor. And it becomes very interesting as you're able to apply all the knowledge that you have as um, a drug the pharmacokinetics of the drug, the pharmacodynamics, the necessity to follow the A1C guidelines and having a tighter control on the diabetes, and your capability to look into the lab values and evaluate what is appropriate for the patient. So it's a combination of factors that as a pharmacist, you're able to apply every single aspect of your knowledge to the benefit of the patient and the physician, impacting the clinical outcome of this patient. So this is exactly a crucial example of a clinical pharmacist role. Um, and so on this slide, I just want you to, um, to leave you with a reflection as a clinical pharmacist. Um, I just created a slogan for every pharmacist who's practicing out there, think outside the box, and let's create a slogan that makes you go think clinical, even if you're in retail setting, hospital setting, 
or you are providing services via telehealth, the pharmacist should have uh, this box, you know, in their mind always of being applying clinical knowledges and think clinically when providing the patient services. So overall, what are the key takeaways from our today's, um, you know, presentation? Pathways and platforms available for clinical pharmacist intervention to augment clinical outcomes. Uh, overview of elements of medication therapy management, a deeper dive, which is chronic care disease management, transitional care management, and patient-centered care. Elements involved in billing and CPT codes for pharmacist-provided care. And we also looked at patient-centered medical home and accountable care organizations, different elements of enhanced MTM model, and the effects on social determinants of health and the health disparities that exist into um, today's generations. So the deepest reflection I have is there is a lot of say about pharmacist gaining provider status. Are we on the path to provider status? Will the underutilized resource as a pharmacist be a consideration in future practices where we become a very crucial element of healthcare teams in projecting clinical outcomes and services to the patients. These are a couple of references that I have used. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, for medication therapy management. There's a lot of details we find on all of these references and uh, different CMS websites uh, for ACO and PCMAH information. This empowers you to make decisions to play key roles with your doctors or whatever form of practice you are in. Uh, thank you so much for being through with uh, this entire journey and through the CE. I hope this will impact uh, positively to everybody's life in terms of your professional services as pharmacist. Um, thank you so much. And you can type your questions in the chat box now. The evaluation access code is 4925. Again, this is on behalf of Achieve CE. We make the CE experience simple so you can get back to what you do the best. Thank you again for everybody's presentation to the uh, entire session. And I hope you have key takeaways from today's uh, CE session. Thank you.